Bastard lion cartoons. Oh, hello. I'm just trying to squeeze the top off this can of spinach using my bare hands. Anyway, welcome to The Beekeeper. Today, I'd like to look at one of comic book and animation's most unlikely of superheroes, Popeye the Sailor. Why unlikely, you might ask? Well, can you think of any other one-eyed, elderly, craggy-faced, super-powered heroes to catch on? Okay, I'll grant you him. Although he wasn't created until 1929, we have to travel back to 1919 in order to tell the story of Popeye's birth. It was in this year that A.C. Seagar's Thimble Theatre newspaper strip was first published. Although the original intention was to have the strip feature parodies of stage melodramas, it soon evolved into the comedic adventures of the Oil family, Father Cole, Mother Nana, Brother Castor and Sister Olive, as well as the rest of the denizens of the seaside town of Sweet Haven. While the strip was well respected, it wasn't until a good 10 years into its lifespan that the character of Popeye was first introduced and its popularity exploded. On a quest to visit an island gambling resort in order to take advantage of his recent acquisition of a rare and lucky whiffle bird, Castor Royal heads down to the docks in order to find a crew for his new ship. Spying a possible candidate in the distance, he calls out, Hey there, are you a sailor? Do you think I'm a cowboy? And with that, an icon was born. While this low-key introduction might not seem like the most auspicious of starts, it didn't take long for the craggy-faced sailor to win over the strip's readers, pretty soon eclipsing most of the Thimble Theatre regulars. By 1933, Popeye was the undisputed star of the show, and it was at this juncture that the celebrated Max and Dave Fleischer of Fleischer Studios stepped in with an offer to buy the film rights to the character. They introduced him to cinema audiences as a guest star in their popular Betty Boop series in a July 1933 short simply entitled Popeye the Sailor, before launching in them his own regular series beginning with I Am What I Am two months later. Disregarding a large proportion of material from Segar's original comic strips, the elements that the Fleischers chose to retain are now the trappings that most people will associate with the character of Popeye. Love interest and feisty damsel in distress olive oil was carried across, as was J. Wellington Wimpy, a rotund hamburger crazed skinflint. But that was about it for the Thimble Theatre regulars. The Fleischers did, however, make a star of Bluto, who had only appeared once in the comic strip series one year previously. From this point on, he would become Popeye's arch nemesis. Then, of course, there's Spinach which wasn't particularly highlighted in the comic strips, but which became the source of Popeye's power in pretty much all of the cartoons. If you have to level one criticism at the Fleischer Brothers Popeye cartoons, it would be that they get quite repetitive when watched in bulk. The studio found a formula that worked and stuck to it. Olive oil is either kidnapped or romanced by Bluto, Bluto kicks the crap out of Popeye, Popeye eats some spinach and returns the favour. Now why anyone would choose to fight over the scrawny olive oil has perplexed cinema goers for years, but I'll give her one thing, she's uh, certainly flexible. But although a lot of the cartoons do stick to a formula, familiarity can encourage playfulness, and a lot of the funniest gags occur when something the audience expects to happen doesn't quite go to plan. Now I got up. I went up and I... I must be getting old. Now don't tell me I left at home. Is there any spinach in the house? Yeah, there is. Here we are, Popeye! These were not the complex, rambling adventures of the comic strips, but at the same time, the Fleischer cartoons were imbued with the same low-key wit as Sega's creations. In part, this was due to the studio's unusual method of recording the characters' voices after the animation was completed. Voice artists like Jack Mercer, Jackson Beck and Mae Questel were able to improvise and improve upon the dialogue without fear of the character's lip movements being out of sync. It simply didn't matter. Come on, sweet pea, we're going to the zoo. Don't let them get scared! Oh, I'll take good care of them, don't worry about that. Well, zoo to you. A big part of the series' early charm seems to originate from the fact that the cartoons were made in New York. Unlike shorts from Disney or Warner Brothers, which were produced in sunny, affluent California, the Popeye shorts were created in the city during the height of the Great American Economic Depression, and this is reflected in the frequently grimy, urban settings of the finished cartoons. They remain pretty unique in that respect. Popeye is just your average working man, ostensibly a sailor but willing to put his hand to any job, and only resorting to confrontation when provoked. 
It's easy to see why Depression era audiences found him an easy fella to sympathise with. Such was his popularity, in fact, that the character is partly credited with boosting spinach sales during the mid 30s, saving an industry in the process. Shoulder on, forward, march. Left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right. But if fight scenes, hidden social commentary and spinach overdoses aren't really your thing, and you still pine for the high adventure of the Thimble Theatre comic strips, then there are some notable, classic exceptions to the Fleischer formula. Taxi! Taxi! Follow that abacadabra Hassan guy, will you? Come on! Get going! They're way ahead of us! up, boy! Show them your heels! Wake up there! What's the matter? You sleep or something? Look. Hey, you got four flats! No wonder you can't run! Come on there, camel cage! Step on it! Let's get going there! What's the matter? Whoop. Whoa! I think you're running dry, that's what's the matter with you, huh? Boy, you eat up an awful lot of gas for only a two-cylinder. That's enough for you, young fella. Here we go! In three 20-minute color featurettes, Popeye did battle against Sinbad the Sailor, Ali Baba and his 40 Thieves, and stumbled across Aladdin's lamp. You know, I could go for a nice cold chocolate soda right now. <gasps> Popeye, Olive Oil has collapsed completely. Whoa! Uh, keep your vitality up, Olive. Huh? That's it. <gasps> Come on, Olive. We gotta save little women and children from bandits. The first two of these featurettes in particular are about as perfect short cartoons as you can find. Everything about them works. From the beautiful eye-popping colour and fun songs to the strange voices and superb animation. Ooh, the most phenomenal, extra special kind of hello. Ah! Halo. These shorts also shoot off the Fleischer's work at its innovative best. Take this scene for example. Notice how three-dimensional the background looks in comparison to the characters. This was achieved by actually building physical sets on turntables that were rotated a frame at a time in order to match hand-drawn cells fitted the glass placed between the model and the camera. This kind of technical wizardry is one of the hallmarks of the Fleischer Studio, who had made their start with shorts featuring Coco the Clown which featured a patented system for rotoscoping, the process of filming a live-action actor and tracing their movements to achieve realism in the movement of animated characters. The third of the Technicolor specials was produced after the Fleischer studio moved to Miami, Florida, and like a number of the cartoons they produced here, it lacks a certain something. Perhaps by this stage, Fleischer was trying a little bit too hard to emulate his rival Walt Disney. The influence of this competitor can certainly be seen in the animated feature Gulliver's Travels, which Fleischer produced at roughly the same time. When the Fleischers parted company with Paramount, Popeye was assigned to their successors, Famous Studios, who carried on with the series until 1957. Although these cartoons have their admirers, I just can't quite get into them in the same way I can with those earlier efforts. Similarly, there have been countless revivals of the character in film and television over the years that I simply don't have the same passion for, so I won't try to crowbar them into a few sentences here. One film I would like to briefly mention though is the much maligned musical directed by Robert Altman and starring Robin Williams. This one comes in for a lot of undue flack, but I'd like to suggest that the time has come to reevaluate it. If you approach the movie as an adaptation of the Thimble Theatre comic strips rather than of the Fleischer cartoons, I think it becomes a much more enjoyable experience. Unfortunately, I think this is probably the reason it failed at the box office. Such is the popularity of the now 80 year old Fleischer cartoons that they have come to define the character. People expect an emphasis on spinach and fighting and that just isn't the focus of the Altman film. So there we have it, the Popeye the Sailor franchise, 90 years old and with talk of another big screen revival still going strong. So until next time remember, you'll be strong to the finish if you eat your spinach. <laughs> oh. Christ, that's disgusting, man. Oh. All of the best looking clips in this episode of The Beekeeper were provided by Thunderbean Animation, and if you'd like to check out some more Popeye, I highly recommend you pick up their DVD.